you, everyone, and welcome. My name is Lindsay Kara Stencil, and I am a partner with the Emerging Companies Group at the law firm of Thompson Hine. I uh, we're getting started here today for our continuing legal education and presentation. Uh, we've got some people continuing to trickle in here, but. We have uh, a lot of material to cover in a very short period of time in which to do it. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started right away. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our other presenter, my fellow partner, Mr. Roger Bora. He's a partner in the firm's intellectual property practice. Uh, today's focus of the presentation is the interconnection and connectivity of intellectual property, venture capital, and startups. So those all sound like very sexy words, and we're going to tell you how they all interact and play together. Uh, we may end up with a brief Q&A session, time permitting. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, Feel free to use the question box located in the control panel on the right side of, of your screen to submit any questions, and we will answer as many of those as we can at the end of the seminar. But before we begin, we always have to have legal mumbo jumbo. That's what us lawyers are here for, right? So uh, we have a few housekeeping items. Uh, number one, we are offering CLE, Continuing Legal Education Credit, today. Um, as part of today's webinar, please be sure to fill out the form and uh, return the webinar affirmation form in the handout section of the control panel um, located at the right side of your screen. The form provides instructions on where to send the completed form so you don't get credit absent sending in the completed form. So send in the completed form. <laughs> and we will announce the tracking code at the very end of the program. So you got to sit tight and hang out with us for a little while. At the, uh, the hand, in the handout panel, excuse me, you can also download a copy of the PowerPoint slides that we have here for you today, as well as the bios of the speakers. And again, we thank you for your interest. And so we are going to go ahead and get started. And I'm going to turn it over to Roger. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And we are certainly hopeful that um, you and your families are staying well during this time. Um, this portion of the seminar is going to focus on these particular topics, and I'm going to focus an issue spot specifically on critical IP principles as they relate to these topics, IP protection intricacies, and IP ownership issues that can impact company valuation and buyer interest, because as, as you can imagine, as buyers look to startups to acquire, they're certainly going to be looking at the IP ownership issues and some critical IP principles that we'll talk about today. And they matter, why do they matter for the company and founders? We'll be looking at it from that angle. We'll be considering exit strategy issues as companies are looking to protect their intellectual property. Uh, we'll also look at it from the perspective of investors and the investors' exit strategies as well as the buyers. So on trademarks, uh, there are two primary ways that um, trademark rights are created in the world. And one is first to file countries. Um, and I'm sorry, um, my computer is, uh, most countries are first to file countries. And I've given an example of a few right there. and when companies file first and secure registration, they are deemed the owner of the marks in those countries. And the reason that's important for startups is obviously, if you're expanding your business internationally, you want to make sure that you've protected your trademarks and brands because buyers are going to consider that uh, as you uh, look to sell a company. There are also first to use uh, countries and uh, first to use countries, you have trademark rights in the geographic regions in which you conduct your business, uh, but typically no rights are created in the regions where you're not conducting your business, and that's one of those IP intricacies, and that is that even though somebody uses a mark first in the United States, they may not have rights in other parts of the country, and that's why trademark registration is still really very important uh, in first to use countries because 
um, as you want to expand your company and your business, you want to make sure that you don't bump into other people. So, for example, if you started your business in the Midwest or in the eastern part of the country and you gain trademark rights in those portions of the country, you don't want to have other people at a later date uh, begin using the same or confusingly similar trademark because that could affect your ability to expand the company nationally. And that's why securing trademark registration in first to use countries is still very important. Um, some of the benefits of trademark registration um, are the presumption of ownership. And obviously, if I'm an investor looking to invest into a company, um, I'd like to know that the company I'm investing in has the presumption of trademark ownership, especially if the trademark rights are um, valuable to the company. It's not simply a, a technology a company or patent or trade secrets, but if the brand is important, um, it, it, it would be very important for the uh, not only the buyer uh, at a merger and acquisition phase, but also possibly to an investor. And it also provides a presumption of validity uh, to, to the ownership of the trademark. And this third bullet I have is, you know, it preserves the right to expand geographically. So again, if you are using a trademark um, in a certain part of the country and you've secured trademark rights, you want to make sure that you can preserve those rights down the road. So you, um, as you have a customer here and there, maybe you have a customer in, in California or San Diego or Seattle, um, you don't want somebody to come in and begin to use the same or similar mark in another part of the country. So securing a trademark registration is still valuable for the geographic expansion. And I've listed a few other items there as well that, um, uh, that that shows why trademark registration uh, is a valuable asset. And one important point is trademark registration in the U.S. does not provide for global uh, brand expansion. So simply securing a registration in the U.S. does not give us the right to expand into Canada or to expand into China because each country uh, has its own trademark uh, rules and laws, and therefore, if you want to expand internationally, um, you need to make sure that you're securing your registrations to have the right to do business there. And again, that's important from a buyer's perspective, because if you're selling a company and you're touting the fact that you have sales around the world and key customers in different parts of the world, um, a buyer would like the assurance that uh, a startup or a company that's looking to sell um, has secured those trademark rights. And so I would look at a registration as um, really a 10-year government business license. The, there are many reasons why companies need to have licenses to do business in other countries. Securing a trademark registration should be considered just one more uh, type of business license, if you will. And the fact that most country trademark registrations are granted for a 10-year period is a pretty nominal fee to uh, secure registration. Let's just talk quickly about uh, trademark selection and brand name selection. Um, early in the process, when LLCs or founders of a startup begin to think about, well, we need an LLC, we need to be able to enter into agreements, they begin to think about the LLC name. And this particular slide shows that simply when we're looking at a new name for a company or a new trademark, and especially if it's important for the company, that we need to be thinking broader than is it simply the same spelling, um, is it the same goods? When we look at trademark infringement and a trademark analysis, we look at whether or not the trademark that we're selecting or the business name is confusingly similar to somebody else's trademark. So we look at, and for this example, we have, if there's a trademark out there for OxyGrow for chemicals for enhancing plant growth, and we're looking to select the name OxyGrow for grow lights for enhancing plant growth, as a company, we might think, well, the name's available because the second mark on the slide, OxyGrow, is not being used by anybody for our products. But the issue is whether or not somebody is already using a confusingly similar mark for related products and services. So when you're at that business name selection phase and it's something that's important to the company, we need to be thinking broader than just the exact spelling for the exact type of products and services. We need to be thinking about confusingly similarity of trademarks and goods. Uh, some misconceptions of, of trademarks that we see quite often in our practice is that when a startup uh, secures a state name registration, maybe an LLC, 
or a state trademark registration. And that simply gives the company the right to use the name. And actually, that's not true because even though the state uh, issues an LLC for a company, uh, it may be that the LLC or that particular name is still considered confusingly similar to somebody else's name. Think about if you register an LLC in Ohio or New York or Delaware, somebody could have that same name or confusingly similar name in California. So um, we need to be thinking, again, uh, trademark searches, business name searches, and not simply registering, and then simply because the state grants it that we're actually free to use it. Uh, our U.S. trademark registration gives us the absolute right to use. That's also a misconception because, as we said earlier, in the U.S., trademark rights are based on use, not based on registration. So simply securing a registration for your trademark doesn't mean that you have the right to actually use it because if there was somebody using the trademark without a registration at common law and they've used it nationally, then those trademark rights, common law trademark rights, would actually uh, trump, if you will, the, the trademark registration. So simply securing a registration alone is not going to um, necessarily give us the absolute right, right to use. Uh, another issue that we see quite a bit is, is uh, companies will come in and say that uh, they searched the USPTO database and they didn't see the trademark that they're looking to, to adopt or the company name they're looking to use. But again, when we search the trademark database, we have to be looking at confusingly similar trademarks and not the identical trademark. So um, that's something we hear quite a bit. Um, and another one is we search the, trademark, the US uh, Patent and Trademark Office database and my name is available because some other company abandoned its trademark rights. Again, that's something that, um, again, if somebody could have abandoned it uh, because they forgot to renew it or it was an oversight, but they could still be using it at common law. So again, we have to look beyond just the USPTO database when we're looking at business names or trademarks, just to be looking at common law trademarks as well. When we get into the international piece of a company, when a company begins to expand into other countries, uh, we have to look at different types of uh, filing options. We could file by with national filings directly into countries. Uh, we could file uh, under something called the Madrid Protocol. Uh, we could file for an EU trademark, which covers all of the EU member countries. So rather than simply filing in five or six or seven EU countries, for example, um, a, a startup can actually save significantly by looking at to file in uh, EUTM, and I'll show an example here in a minute, but it's, it's, a, it's a cost savings. And the same with the Madrid Protocol, a company can file for international trademark protection um, through um, filing a trademark application with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, designating multiple countries uh, through the Madrid Protocol and uh, secure applications in other countries. So again, for today in issue spotting, this is uh, something to know is available. Um, it can save a lot of money. Um, and so it's something you want to look at and discuss with your trademark lawyer as you're looking at international trademark expansion. And if you'd like to learn more about that, I do have a blog at trademarktitan.com and podcast seven um, actually discusses this exact, this exact issue. Um, just an example on some estimated costs. If, if a company uh, decided to file in, say, nine or ten uh, international countries or different countries and file directly into the country with, say, local counsel, you could be looking at $20,000 in fees and costs um, absent any major issues, a third-party objection um, or a rejection at the trademark office. But if those same filings were filed via the Madrid Protocol, the savings could be about 40%. So there are options for, for smaller companies who are looking in, in larger companies, looking to streamline their international protection um, and looking at different strategies and, and cost saving strategies. But the thing with the Madrid Protocol is it's not one size fits all. Um, it's very fact specific. So we have to make sure that the facts align and it's something that uh, makes sense for that particular trademark. Again, uh, the, the cost savings of an EU trademark versus um, filing in, say, these countries right here, four countries, 
um, can be quite significant. Uh, national filings for no issues. You file in each country. You hire local counsel. Um, and you uh, secure registration without any major issues. You're looking at about $7,800, $8,000. Or you could file for a European Union trademark for 3500 or so. So it's a pretty significant difference for a small company looking to uh, save on some costs. Let's take a look now at some due diligence issues around the trademark space. Um, obviously, when a company is, is, is uh, selling uh, its business and you have a buyer, the company, the buyer, is going to look at trademark registrations. Uh, where are the trademark registrations secured? Is it primarily a U.S.-based company with most sales in the U.S.? Does it have an international presence? And what type of, of, of protection has been gained internationally? And we'll also look at first-to-file countries. So if, if, if a company is selling into first-to-file countries, uh, the buyer is going to be interested in that because if, if there are significant sales in, in, in these first-to-file countries, um, the buyer may, you know, would, would prefer to have the assurance to know that trademark rights have been secured. So that's just something that could come up during the due diligence phase. We also look to see if the trademark filings were filed in the correct party's name, especially in the U.S., because if we file in the incorrect party's name or the party that doesn't have control of the quality, um, those applications are typically void. So you could have situations where you have filed in a certain company's name and then to, to later learn that those applications or those registrations may not be enforceable. So that's something that would come up during the due diligence phase. And we'd also look at um, whether or not the founders of, of a startup originally uh, filed for trademark protection um, in their own personal name and whether or not those assets have been transferred uh, to a subsequently formed LLC. Um, you know, correct address, this is something that comes up. It may not sound like a big deal, and for a lot of countries it's not. But for some countries it is, and if, if the asinor has a different address in the trademark registration than is on the uh, uh, M&A transaction documents and the assignment documents, that may be just an extra hurdle that has to be covered when we're recording uh, trademark assignments with, with certain countries. And, you know, in the due diligence phase, we may also look at where is the, where's the startup or where's the seller? Where are they manufacturing other countries? Do they have licensees in other countries? Do they have distributors in other countries? Because we want to make sure that we've secured registrations in those countries, and we want to also make sure that the distributors or licensees haven't registered the seller's trademarks. Because, again, if, if they're first to file countries and the uh, distribution agreement terminates or the license agreement terminates, you may find that you're in a difficult, difficult situation um, with trying to, re to secure those trademark rights away from the distributors and the licensees. Uh, we're also going to look at whether or not the company has secured registration for the core marks and the core goods and services. Um, we'll also typically look at non-use vulnerability. So if a company has registrations around the world, we'll also look to see if the marks have been used during the last three years or so. Because in most countries, if a trademark is not used for three consecutive years, trademark registration becomes vulnerable to cancellation. So, again, this is something that may come up during a due diligence. Um, we'll also look at trademark licenses and quality control if the seller has a trademark license, um, whether or not the seller has engaged in proper quality control um, oversight to make sure that the trademark does not become invalidated for failure to police a licensed trademark. We'll obviously look at liens. Have there been any liens put on some of the uh, intellectual property and the trademarks, and, you know, some of them are older, so we want to make sure that we can clear those liens off uh, before before a deal, before the sale. We'll look at chain of title. Uh, there are cases where, you know, the mark is filed by, by party uh, X. It's subsequently assigned to three parties, and now the seller has is claiming ownership, but there's a break in the chain of title. So this is also something that can come up during uh, the due diligence phase on, on the trademark side. And we'll also look for renewal and maintenance filings, making sure that the, the IP is properly maintained, especially during that period of transition. I have the fall between the cracks where what you don't want to have happen is 
during the IP due diligence phase, uh, the seller is, you know, the buyer's acquiring the IP, but some of the maintenance deadlines are kind of flowing through that period and some deadlines are being missed. So what we would typically do is ask the seller if there are any deadlines coming um, to make sure that those deadlines are properly handled. Uh, last slide on trademarks. Um, we also want to look at domain name issues when, you know, companies or management uh, request that an employee uh, reserve a domain name for the company. It's always a good idea to make sure the company opens up its own domain name account because what we do see at, at, during due diligence is a former employee reserve the domain name and it's still sitting in the former employee's uh, account. And so now we have to see how to, to go about uh, 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 getting control of that account so we can, the seller can uh, assign the domain name to, to the buyer. Uh, a couple of other issues that, that come up is when there are multiple countries at issue, some countries have country-specific documents such as China. Some of the documents have to be in the foreign language, um, and it's easier to have these documents in advance of a closing um, and so that when the parties are signing the documentation, all of these uh, documents can be properly executed um, in advance. Rather than putting these as, as a post-closing item, sometimes it can be difficult to track down the proper signatures after the closing. Um, another tip is secure the trademark registration certificates in advance. Uh, have the seller Uh, uh, gather all the trademark registration certificates uh, they have and have that ready uh, for closing. It's always easier to clean up and handle some of these issues at or before closing than it is for post-closing. Um, and it's always a good idea to have post-closing uh, a signatory, so somebody who can file documents uh, post-closing. With that, we'll move into copyrights. Um, this is, when, when you have young companies, a lot of these issues I'm talking about today are, get overlooked for various reasons. Um, one is obviously a cost issue for a young company to take a look at all of these issues. But this one's actually, the copyright side is pretty, um, doesn't cost much to make sure we, we acquire all the copyrights that, that we should own. And the types of copyrights a company might have are in its website, uh, perhaps photographs or product manuals and, you know, marketing materials and packaging and software. So anytime a company is, is using a third party, and we'll see in a second, we want to make sure that we're acquiring those copyrights adequately from these third parties. So how are copyrights created? Well, first of all, to have a copyright, um, it has to be original to the creator. We can't copy it from somebody else. It ha and it has to have protectable expression. It can't just be facts or some basic ideas. So it has to be original, has to be comprised of protectable expression, and it has to be fixed in a tangible medium, meaning it has to be recorded or written down. And federal registration is not required. And we're not getting into today copyright infringement, but we do see quite a bit third parties or companies and the marketing folks who We'll just grab something off the internet thinking, well, there's no copyright notice on it. Uh, you know, it's not being protected by copyright. Well, anything that's created that is eligible for copyright, uh, copyright attaches at the moment of creation. So anything that you see out there actually has a copyright attached to it if it has the, the uh, minimum requirements. Um, and it provides valuable access. A registration that will provide um, court access, if somebody's infringing the copyright, you at least have to have a registration or have attempted to secure a registration to have access to the court. So it does have value um, uh, for our copyright ownership. This is, this is a key issue, uh, and that is who owns the copyrights. Um, the general rule is authors and creators of the work own the copyright. So if a company has an employee create uh, a work within the scope of, of, of employment, then the company would own the copyright. So there's no issue there. But what about if a vendor or an agency uh, creates work for the, for the company? Um, if an agency creates a software or some key, uh, some key uh, product manuals um, or some key works that are valuable to the company, um, it's typically 
not going to be assigned uh, to the to the commissioning party unless we have an assignment document or it's a work made for hire and we have a work made for hire agreement and typical in most works are not considered work made for hire they're considered um, uh, copyrights are owned by the the, the 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 author of the work so absent a transfer or an assignment the ownership of the copyright typically is not transferred to the uh, the commissioning party. So if you're a startup um, and you're having software commission or any type of work commission, any the agreement should should specifically state that um, any and all work that's created on behalf of the company that's copyrightable or any other IP is being assigned to to the company. We see this quite a bit where. Uh, that language is not in the agreement, so the party believes they own the copyright, but in fact the the, uh, the the vendor or the third party owns the copyright, and we have to go back after the fact to have them sign an agreement. So it's always a good idea to check your agreements to see if the copyrights were indeed assigned. Um, a few due diligence items. Um, obviously, at closing, if I'm an investor, um, or I'm a buyer, I want to make sure that uh, the company owns good title to the copyrights that are material to the business. We want to be careful of co-authors and joint owners. Um, you know, we don't want to share the copyrights. We don't have to, uh, we don't want a third party or another co-author or co-owner to be out there uh, um, using in their business. Um, and we want to make sure too that the founders of the company, if they bring in IP and copyrights, that if I'm an investor, I want to make sure that they're assigning those those rights over to the LLC. And in some cases, you know, I have rights of publicity issues. Um, some cases there are works that have people in them. You know, maybe they're employees or they're celebrities. We want to make sure that we have the proper documentation if we're acquiring a company and there are issues with potential issues of right of publicity. And again, my, you can check out podcast aid at trademarktitan.com on that issue. Patents. Um, patents protect, I'm not, I will not be talking about design patents today. This is talking about uh, uh, utility patents. Uh, and utility patents protect functional ideas that are useful. They're novel. It's something that's new, not already known, and non-obvious. Uh, they're not trivial. Uh, the prior art doesn't teach what the invention uh what the invention is. So you have to meet these specific hurdles in order to have utility patent protection. And here's a critical uh, critical information uh, for patent protection, and that is a patent provides the right to exclude others from making, using, selling, or offering for sale or importing the invention. It actually does not give the right to practice the invention. So this is a critical uh, this is critical information for an investor, for a buyer, uh, to make sure that even though a startup or the, the, the target uh, party, uh, target company has patent portfolio, that, that just understand that patents do not give us the right to actually practice those inventions. They actually uh, give us the right to exclude other people from practicing our invention. And what's an example of that? Uh, let's say I have a patent on this chair. Or this 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 apparatus it has four legs it has a back it has a platform that you can sit on and i own a patent um, for this invention or this device this apparatus and you want to develop and sell this particular product well in order to sell this product you essentially have to practice my invention so even though you have a patent on this particular um, invention it doesn't mean you can practice it you would essentially need to receive a license from me to have the ability to practice it. So again, as an investor, when you're looking at a company's patents or inventions, and as a company also, make sure that when you receive a patent that, and we'll see this in a minute, you actually also consider a uh, freedom to operate opinion to make sure that your patent is actually, your invention, you can actually practice it. Some other key issues on patents is timing. Uh, in the U.S., uh, typically, you need to file within one year of disclosing your invention or your patent. Um, now if you have a description in a publication, you have public use, you've offered it for sale, one-year clock will begin to tick. So you have one year to file um, 
uh, your patent application. And in some cases, foreign countries have no particular uh, clock on uh, on patent protection or for filing for patent protection. So once your invention is published, you may be prevented from securing patent protection in these other countries. Um, and there was a recent uh, Supreme Court decision that even a private meeting to sell with an NDA was uh, considered a publication to start the, the one-year clock. So even NDAs may not uh, prevent the, the clock from ticking. So again, if I'm, if I'm an investor, um, some key questions I may want to ask is, uh, okay, you have a patent filing or we're about to file for patent protection. Uh, when did you first begin to talk to third parties about um, about the invention? Because you want to make sure that if you're investing uh, a lot of capital, that, uh, that the, the, the patent's going to be valid and enforceable. Uh, some due diligence, um, you know, again, we want to make sure that the inventors have assigned the any inventions, the, 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 the uh, inventors have assigned the inventions to the startup, including the founders. Um, again, if I'm a buyer, we're going to be looking at uh, um, the, the names and the holders of the patents, making sure that they've been properly assigned. If I'm an investor, I also want to make sure that the patents have also been properly assigned. Um, we'll also look to see if the patents are, are, are they pending applications or are they granted? And um, are there any improvements? If there are some older patents, I know for startups this may not be the case, but if you're looking to invest in a more mature company uh, then you, there's a patent portfolio, you, you want, might want to look to see what's the cycle of the patent. Is the patent coming to close? Have they filed for any uh, extended protection to prolong that patent protection? And another key issue is making sure that the granted patent actually protects the commercialized products. Um, you know, we see a uh, patent application is filed, uh, perhaps through the prosecution, the attorneys have to amend the claims to make sure that uh, to overcome prior art. So over time, the claims are amended, and then perhaps the product itself at the commercialization phase also changes. And so one of the questions is going to be during a due diligence review um, is whether or not the patent portfolio or a key patent actually covers the product as actually commercialized. So again, that's just something to be, be thinking about. And obviously can competitors design around the patent? So if the patent is narrow, we wanna make sure during due diligence, a buyer may wanna make sure that the patent actually is pretty secure. Uh, I mentioned this a moment ago, uh, review of patentability versus freedom to operate opinions it could be two different things. So whether or not something is patentable is different from whether or not something uh, you can practice the invention. We saw with the example of the chairs, right? So if the rocking chair is patentable, but perhaps we aren't able to practice it because we infringe the, the you know, my chair, the rocking chair infringes the the standard chair. So you may want to look at that. And a buyer may look and have freedom to operate opinions conducted to make sure that the targets uh, a patent portfolio is actually uh, non-infringing third-party works. We also want to look at, I'm not going to go through all of these, but obviously maintenance fees, is, it becomes an issue. Um, whether or not an issued patent actually um, has become unenforceable. Perhaps case law has made a patent unenforceable. Perhaps there's, perhaps there's some prior art that was not disclosed that has become discovered. That could render the patent unenforceable. And again, joint owners. We want to make sure that uh, as the company is uh, building its IP portfolio from trademarks to copyrights to patents, if we're a startup, we just want to make sure that we're securing our copyrights. We're making sure that we're, we're, we're claiming our patents. We're assigning them from the inventors and that we don't have any joint ownership issues. Um, another issue that comes up is government funding. So if, if I'm an investor or a buyer and um, the, the, the target or the, the seller has used government funds to, um, to create his, its invention or use funding for the patents, uh, government funding can, can throw some issues into uh, the government having certain rights and, and some hurdles. So that's something that um, should also be looked at as well. 
and also third-party licenses, third-party licenses in and out. In some cases, again, you may need a license uh, to practice an invention. So if, if uh, you're a buyer, the buyer, or you're an investor, you might want to make sure that there's no inbound licenses necessary to practice uh, the invention. Right, let's quickly talk about some licenses. Um, when a company is selling and that the buyer is, is going to look at certain things in a license agreement, one is, is it exclusive? Um, is, what about the territory? Is it too limiting for the buyer? Um, and and, and you, we also want to make sure that the seller is actually the correct party to the agreement. So in some cases, you may look at the agreements and see that uh, the seller is not the correct party. So that's something that may need to be cleaned up. And a big issue is anti-assignment clauses, making sure that um, if I'm an investor and I'm investing in a company and a, a big part of the, the asset is some form connected to a license, we want to make sure that the, the startup uh, is able to assign that license. Um, and recently, uh, we've been seeing with some major brands transfer fees. So you end up seeing potential, if, if you want to assign this license, not only do you need consent, but you may have to, uh, 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 there may be a transfer fee, a pretty hefty transfer fee to make that happen. And of course, we want to make sure it's fully executed. We come across that where we have one signature, uh, we need both signatures. Uh, now let's touch upon trade secrets, some key issues of trade secrets. So what's a trade secret? A trade secret is information or, uh, you know, can be a formula or a method that provides independent economic value to the company and it's not generally known. Uh, so we have a secret, we use that a secret recipe in our business, uh, but we also have to take reasonable efforts to protect it. And this is where companies sometimes fall short, and especially if you're a young company, um, you may not be thinking about this issue, but it's something to be thinking about, and that is making sure that we protect it properly. And there are certain things that need to be done, one of which is making sure that the documents are marked as confidential. Um, and some of the some of the trade secrets can be, again, formulas, ingredients, a process, a customer list, and we have to take reasonable steps um, to properly protect it or we could lose trade secret protection. Um, and here are some examples of some of the efforts that we can, we can engage in, uh, confidentiality agreements, um, policies and procedures so that when employees change or management changes, um, everyone knows exactly what to do, that, uh, you know, when we need to gain access to the safe and bring out the recipe, who gets to see it? How does it go back into the safe? How do we keep control? Um, do we have it in a computer? Do we have it safeguarded with a password? These are the things that may come into play um, when a company is selling itself, selling the company, and claiming a trade secret as one of its primary assets. And again, other considerations, making sure that any founders that may have may bring a trade secret into the company actually transfers a trade secret to, to the company. Um, just a couple more minutes, uh, some typical IP due diligence considerations. So um, a company is selling, uh, these are types of, these are some requests that will come from the buyer. Um, give us a list of all of your assets, all of your patents, your copyrights, um, you know, and you may be required to provide physical documentation supporting your ownership. And we, it goes back to the copyright issues, making sure that you have um, your copyrights in order. Um, the bottom line is the reps and warranties are going to say, seller, startup, we, we, we uh, get, provide your rep and warranty that you have exclusive IP ownership. We don't want joint ownership issues assignment issues, and we would like to make sure that you've secured your registrations uh, around the world. A few other items, uh, sellers uh, will need to provide a rep and warranty typically that their IP doesn't infringe third parties, that they don't uh, know of any third parties infringing their IP, and that there are no current threats. And of course, again, liens, making sure that the, the IP is, cl uh, is clear of any third party uh, encumbrances. So at the end of the day, when a company is looking to make a deal, um, if some of you older on this, you know, let's make a deal. We want to make sure that when we look behind the curtain um, for at the assets of the selling company, that um, 
the buyer is pleased with what they see. Uh, and with that, um, I will turn the presentation over to Lindsay. Thank you. And hi there, everyone. Uh, well, holy smokes, like that was so much great material from Roger. And, you know, if you have questions or any of these things sort of um, spark some, oh, gosh, should I look into this idea uh, for you, please be sure to follow up with Roger after this. Uh, so his email is here on the screen. Um, so now we're going to get into uh, to my piece and part here. So we're going to talk a little about venture capital and uh, due diligence related to that. So Roger did a deep dive there for you in terms of thinking about IP due diligence and all of the things that you need to think about there. But that's just one piece of the puzzle in order to get this deal closed for you. So let's hope and assume you took all of Roger's great information and you marked everything confidential and you protected your trade secrets and all of those things. Um, that's one piece of the puzzle. The next piece of the puzzle is some, you know, day-to-day -day blocking and tackling, getting this stuff right. And so one of the things we think about here is, you know, just general due diligence. Folks are going to do due diligence on your business itself. Do you understand the unit economics of your business? Does your business model make sense? Do your projections make sense? They're going to go through every single line on your Excel sheet, and they're going to challenge you on those things. So you have to make sure that those are well supported, that your financial information that you provided is correct, because they will ask for all of it. And if you want funding, you will provide all of it. So make sure you have those things buttoned up, and you get it right, get it right. Uh, so also, we have to think about legal due diligence, wah, wah, lawyers. So for legal due diligence, we're going to think about making sure that the following things are clean, tight, and available at the press of a button to share in your data room. So the first is going to be organizational documents. Let's make sure that we formed our company properly. We have the requisite filings made in whatever state that we are doing business in. Uh, make sure our governing docs make sense. So, you know, the farther we get down the path in our startup, the more likely we are to have screwed something up. And so making sure that your organizational docs um, and your governing docs match not only how you've been running your business day to day, but tie through and tie together. So, you know, generally speaking, if you're thinking about raising capital at some point in the future, it might behoove you to have someone take a look at these with fresh eyes to make sure that there's nothing that someone's going to catch in a data room that's going to cause pause. And because people pause, then they start digging, and then they look for the things that are wrong instead of just assuming that everything's right. So the name of the game in due diligence, I can't stress it enough, is to find the gotcha, to find the problem. So these are easy opportunities for you to not give them an opportunity to find the problem. Uh, additional documents that you should make sure that you have, you should have all your contracts, your corporate governance, so that's your board meeting minutes. I know not lots of startups are flying by the seat of their pants and maybe not doing all of these things properly, but I can't stress enough to you how important it is to make sure that you're keeping minutes and you're, you know, validating um, board actions and you're making sure that you're getting the requisite approvals for stock option issuances and entering, entering into partnerships and things of that nature because you're going to need to prove that you took the the actions with requisite corporate authority. Um, and then, importantly, accurate cap table. You know, this is just math, but you would be surprised on how many people screw it up. So an accurate, accurate cap table here, we're thinking about making sure that the percentages at the bottom in the very far right column, some to 100%. So you'd be shocked on how many cap tables I've seen that some to like 130%, 142.1%. Um, we only have 100% of the pie here, so it's got to sum up to 100. And then that cap table, make sure if you've got it in a couple different places in that data room that you are making sure it's the same table in every room because in every file folder, excuse me, because if you go and you have a couple different cap tables filed and we maybe don't have um, them all matching, that is a surefire reason to 
cause pause by the person who might be looking to invest in you and may end up killing your deal. So one of the things I like to talk about in preparing clients for, for due diligence, if you're going in for funding or acquisition, either or, is process to make sure that you have all of these things that I've been talking about uploaded to include the NDAs, et cetera, that um, Roger was talking about earlier. And so without process, there is no progress. And so I recommend to my clients um, and folks that I work with every day to say, hey, once a month, you are going to look at all of the new contracts, organizational doc changes, governance doc changes, board meeting minutes, whatever it's going to be. And you're going to upload those to your data room. And you're like, what is a data room? It could be Dropbox. It could be Box.com. It could be Google Drive. It could be, you know, any of these at OneDrive. Um, as long as it's a shareable link, digital link that you can share with someone at the drop of a hat, um, I think that is the best way to think about it. We do not want to get caught flat-footed here where, you know, someone asks you, hey, share your link to your data room with me. And you're like, yo, hold up, I need three weeks because I need to figure this out. Nothing says unorganized and loses momentum for you quite like that. You know, if you've got momentum and someone says they're interested, do not waste a moment. Hit send. Make sure your data is accurate and keep going. So on the next slide, assuming it changes over, um, you know, one of the things I have to blame for entrepreneurs because I have to be dummy downer of a lawyer is that, you know, we all get very excited that someone is maybe talking to us and they're thinking about investing in our company and holy smokes, aren't we the bee's knees? Well, yes, maybe you are, but I need you to be quiet about that. So when you are thinking about raising capital, you shouldn't be broadcasting that to the universe. Um, that is called a general solicitation, and that's a quick and dirty way to put the gabosh on your fundraise for the next six months of your life. And so, after you doing a crowdfunding raise, and you're just doing a general, um, typical private placement, you know, so you're selling either convertible notes, saves, equity in your company, any of those things, we have to be very, very careful that we're not broadcasting that to the world. And so, yeah, look, you can still release, if you do PR and you have that on a normal schedule and a normal cadence, and you're talking about your business, and, you know, that's totally fine. If you're announcing new customers, that's great stuff. Um, you know, keep that going if that's what you've been doing the whole time. Um, you know, you just want to make sure that the folks who are, permitted to distribute information about your company within your organization, keep that in a pretty tight silo, particularly when you're raising capital, because, you know, you've got lots of risks with social media. You know, you get some entrepreneur team, team members, you know, that are that might be with you. They're young. They're new. This is super exciting. And, you know, they overhear the CEO and CTO talking about a fundraise, and they go put it on their social media account, you know, their Instagram page or Twitter account or whatever the hell the kids use these days. And they're starting to talk about that, and you're like, oh, my gosh, they just ruined this. So, you know, you have to be really, really careful. Make sure everybody's aware that this is highly confidential. You should not be talking about it, and you should have very specific people who are allowed and authorized to, to put anything out electronically. But, hey, after you close – and I mean final close. So if you do a first close and you're still raising money, we have to be quiet. But when we get to our final close, we can, we can talk about that and how wonderful we are and how much money we raised and how we are, in fact, the bee's knees thereafter. So with that, so now we get into some, like, real meat and kind of stuff. So just brace, the brace for this, uh, you who are not lawyers out there but are still participating, and thank you for doing that today. Um, you know, some of the things we have to think about when we're structuring our investment deals is that there's sort of a way to do this that's right, and then there's sort of a way to do this that can make your life a little bit more challenging. So proper corporate formation. Um, I use the word corporate pretty specifically there. Um, you know, a lot of folks do like to get started with the LLC. It's more cost effective. It's easier. There's not quite as much maintenance. And I hear all of that. And, and we can solve for that if you initially formed as an LLC. Totally okay. Versus the C corporation. Um, C corporation typically um, you know, a little bit more process involved, a little bit more structure and rigidity to it, a lot more filings, um, just sort of a little bit more of a pain most startups feel. So, 
you know, you're weighing these two things as you're thinking about getting started, um, you know, for, for those of us seeking continuing legal education credit. LLC formation is governed by Section 1705 of the Ohio Revised Code. Um, you know, we if you don't have an operating agreement in place, an operating agreement is the contract that controls how the parties that are in, in, in concert working together on a company are going to interact with each other. If you don't have one of those, you're kind of governed by the statute. And I've had a lot of folks who are like, hey, I'm going to fly by the seat of my pants and I'm going to go ahead and at some point in time, I'm going to get an operating agreement in place with my partners. Naturally, something goes wrong. Then we're having a breakup event. And guess what we're governed by? Not an operating agreement that didn't exist, but the Ohio Revised Code, which isn't that bad, but it's also not necessarily what we always want to be defaulting to. So that's the reason we draft operating agreements. Those operating agreements should set out the rules of the road on how we're all going to behave with each other, how voting is going to occur, what do we do with the money, how do we make decisions about the money. It's always important stuff. So, uh, you know, I would say if you are going to form an LLC, I don't even care if you're still in a single member LLC for a period of time, put an operating agreement in place, have good corporate practices, and, you know, get yourself started on the right foot there. Um, now, C Corporation in Ohio. Um, you know, typically, if you are going to be raising capital from institutional investors, and when I say that, I mean angel funds, venture funds, things of that nature, they're going to want you to be a C Corporation formed in Delaware doing business in Ohio. That said, if you're like, I don't want to pay Delaware fees right now, I get it. So you can form yourself in Ohio, and uh, that's going to be governed by Section 1701 of the Ohio Revised Code. Um, you know, we have here, we have the Articles of Incorporation. It's going to talk about the bylaws and how do, how do things work there. Um, you know, and I still would advise clients, even if you're, you know, just saying, hey, I'm just getting set up. I filed my Articles of Organization. I've got the the bare bones of the skeleton set up here, you know, do put a shareholder agreement in place. Um, you know, it's much easier to put some of these things in place from the onset and carry them forward than it is to try to request certain things that you as a founder might want or desire in a shareholder's agreement or voting agreement, etc. later on down the line. It's easier, so if you take nothing away from this section, it's easier to carry forward than it is to try to, like, drop something in new on an investor who, um, you know, plainly said, probably doesn't care what you want because they want to invest in your company. Um, you know, so as I said earlier, proper corporate formation, I can't stress this enough, is really the Delaware C Corp, and then you file uh, what we call foreign license filings or right to do business in the other state that you're doing business in. So this is governed by title eight of the Delaware General Corporate Law. Um, you know, why Delaware? People are always like, Lindsay, why do I have to do this? It's very expensive and very painful and very annoying to me. And I hear that. Um, but the reason that we do this is because Delaware has the most friendly corporate code in the nation, and it is what all investors sort of look to and know. And so when you're doing weird things, be it in due diligence or in your corporate formation, it again causes, you know, pause and gives people a reason to say no. Don't give people a reason to say no. Set yourself up as a Delaware C-Corp if you have the resources to do so. File your foreign license filing in Ohio or whatever great state of the nation you might be in, maybe lots of them, if you're killing the game. And, you know, deal deal with that. The, the Delaware Corporate Code really is the cleanest code for um, ma allowing you to manage your business day to day. And it's that the Delaware Corporate Code is so sophisticated, we actually have what we call the Delaware, Delaware Chancery Courts, excuse me, who handle only things governed by the Delaware Corporate Code each and every day. And so you're not just getting some, you know, judge, God bless them, who have to deal with domestic issues and, you know, some other contract issue and then your business and some very niche business issue, they're only handling these business issues each and every day. So, you know, you can kind of take a little bit of comfort in that, particularly as you get bigger and more amazing and you've taken on lots of other people's money and you have lots of cooks in your kitchen. Um, 
So, you know, just to note here, you know, to be legally compliant as you're working through your documents, particularly fundraising documents, one of the things you have to attest to is the fact that you did um, or you are properly formed and filed in each and every state in which you do business. And so in Ohio, you know, I list the form there. You have to make sure that you do that um, to be protected by the laws of the state of Ohio, but also to be able to attest to the things that you are attesting to in your doc sets that we'll talk about here in a, in a minute. So a couple things about Delaware versus Ohio. You know, I have to flag for people, look, in Delaware, there's a cost of doing business. It's just how life goes. They're going to charge you an annual corporate tax. Um, at first, when you're a Delaware corporation and you see it, particularly if you have, you know, 10 million shares, they're going to send you a tax bill. It's going to say something insane, like, you know, $20,000. You do not owe that because you probably lost a lot of money because you're trying to, you know, grow your business. And you're in the not-so-wonderful part of the hockey stick. And, and so uh, you're, you're going to look at something that's more like three to $500 to do that. Um, you do have an annual statutory agent filing fee. Unless you have an office in Delaware or a person in Delaware, you need a statutory agent. That's going to be another fee. It's just a cost to do in business. Um, and what do those people do? They mail you your mail. That's about it, um, unless you get sued or something. Then it's going to be something else. Um, and, yes, you do have some dual filing fees. You're going to have fees that you pay in Delaware, and then to form in these or, you know, be recognized in these other states, you're going to have your license fees. But such is life. Such is life. So what if I formed myself as, a, as an LLC or an Ohio corporation, and now I need to become a Delaware corporation? Yeah, that happens all the time. Um, and in my practice group, we do a ton of those a year. <laughs> and so here, you know, you have to be in compliance with the Denver, Delaware General Corporate Law, um, sections uh, 251 through 267. I'm not going to bore you ad nauseum with the details of those, but effectively, what we're doing is in this, you know, in the simplest terms, we're taking an LLC and we're shifting it. We're just now making it recognized in Delaware and domiciled in Delaware, and it's now a C corp. Um, you know, we we have to think about um, properly transitioning all the shares over, making sure like share classes are recognized the way they might have been in Ohio over to Delaware. There's a there's a bunch of paperwork, and we got to make sure we're not tripping any tax laws. So I do recommend that you call someone and you don't just go at this alone and hope for the best because you might be looking at some, you know, uh, egregious tax bill, and no one likes surprises from the tax man. So, you know, just make sure that you call someone about that and you're not, you know, stepping on any landmines. Um, when you do convert, you convert over to Delaware. You still have to file a form with the state of Ohio or whatever state you're converting out of to say, hey, yo, I converted. I'm a Delaware C-Corp now. Still need to be recognized here. Thanks. And so we make sure that we do that. Um, the realities and, and practicalities here, if any of you are saying, like, shoot, I might want to convert to a Delaware C Corp before the end of the year. I cannot encourage you enough <laughs> to call your counselor right now uh, because it is the season to be converting. And so we have lots of these in the queue. Uh, sometimes they're very, very complicated. And, um, you know, really we do run out of time because sometimes we have to get consents from different shareholders or members. There's timetables involved there. Um, I'm not going to tell you it's impossible here today, um, but we are nearing the end of the year. And so we, you do have to be cognizant of those, of those timetables. Other realities, things I'll flag, you're like, shoot, I'm really trying to get funded. I have a great business. That's not going to kill a deal if you're an LLC and, and you're looking to seek investment from a venture fund. But most venture funds have a requirement that they cannot carry into their fund um, unintended business income tax issues. And so that requires venture funds to invest in C-Corps. But a lot of times, if they really love your business enough, they will say, hey, as a condition precedent to us investing in your company, you have to convert into a Delaware C Corp immediately prior to our financing. And lo and behold, because someone's giving you millions of dollars, you now have capital to pay for this conversion. So don't fret. You know, even if you get to a place where someone wants to give you money, um, you can do it, and really you can use some of the proceeds of that fundraise to pay for that. So all good stuff. 
So, I'm moving right along. Um, to be a lot of material to cover and not, not much time left to do it. So, great. You have your IPL buttoned up. You made it through due diligence. You are a beautiful Delaware C Corp or whatever you are, and we're going to get you to a Delaware C Corp. And you get a term sheet, so you can say things are going to freeze through those. Um, and so that's awesome, but don't go at this alone if you are a startup. Uh, make sure that you are calling your counselor. We deal with these, you know, hundreds of times a year, and we know what to look for in terms of the material terms. So I always joke about I actually have an entire presentation on term sheets called Money, Power, and Respect. So uh, money, power, respect are the key to deals. And so money, economic terms, are incredibly significant in terms of your deal. How much are you giving up? What amount of money are you get, getting that for? And we'll break down a couple of those here shortly. And then control-based terms, so power, who has the power here not only to make day-to-day -day decisions in the business, but to determine when you can take on additional financing, et cetera. Term sheets can be binding or non-binding. Generally, they are non-binding. Um, and the reason being is, you know, they're really created to make the lawyers' lives easier and to save startups money because a well-written term sheet can allow lawyers to easily translate that over into a deal doc set instead of negotiating each and every one of the hundreds of pages of your deal documents, which will cost you about, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars if you wanted to do it that way. I would not advise that. Have a term sheet. Get it drafted right. Call your lawyer. Don't go at it alone. So, economic term is money, is the money portion of money, power, and respect. And you're like, what's the respect portion? It's not annoying the hell out of the people on the other side that you're trying to get money from. And vice versa. It's, it's a two-way street. Respect always is. So, economic terms in your term sheet, we have a pre-money and a post-money valuation. Pre-money goes something like this. Before the money comes in, your company is valued at X. Let's use a number like $9 million here. So you have a pre-money valuation of $9 million, and you said, I want to raise $1 million because you've been really capitally efficient. And so your pre-money valuation is $9 million. Your raise is $1 million. So your post-money valuation after you raise that $1 million is $10 million. Post-money valuation, $10 million. Nine plus one equals 10. Great. So obviously that's going to be a huge portion of this. Next is your option pool size. So your option pool is, you know, the way that investors are going to look at you and say, how are you incenting the rest of the people in this team to do the things you need them to do so that we all make a bunch of money? And so they want to see that be a good size so you can raise your, excuse me, you can hire lots of people and, you know, acquire the best talent. Who doesn't want that? But the tricky part here is this. Sometimes they say, hey, we want a, an option pool that's, you know, put in pre-money coming in, and sometimes they say they want it, you know, 20% post-money, you know, dilution or post-money, um, it'll look like 20% you know, after the money comes in. And so what happens there is that actually means that they're putting it in before, if we're doing a post-money valuation determination or post-money percentage valuation, they're putting that in before their other people's, their money comes in. And so the people who take the massive dilutive effect there are really the founders and existing investors. So you've got to make sure you're reading that right so you know where is that going into play and, you know, how are we, how are we thinking about that. Liquidation preferences. So sometimes we talk about this in terms of the waterfall, but really the concept is this. How are people getting their money back and in what order? And that's why we talk about a waterfall, because the water falls down, okay? And so so does the money. Um, so liquidation preferences, um, you know, sometimes, uh, so what is a liquidation preference? It's the right to get a, your mon the investor's money back before maybe some other parties get their money's back, you know, their money back based on a couple of things that might happen. So we have participating preferred liquidation preferences, which means the investors get their money back first. And after they get, say, their million dollars back, then everybody, including investor, participates pro rata based on their ownership percentage. So they get a million dollars plus their percentage. Pretty sweet deal. Um, Non-participating, or I would classify as a more standard preferred, um, you're going to look at either the investors going to get their money back or 
if it's better for them, if they participate in a pro rata, a pro rata um, position, meaning how much did they own? Say they own 10%, they get 10% of the exit price. So that's where you kind of want to see your people, um, you know, COVID and the economic conditions have started to see that participating preferred percolate up a little bit more. So be careful of that. And then you're like, what the heck is this multiple and see? So sometimes not only do investors want their money back, but they want maybe two or three X times their money back before they're going to give you your money. So yikes, we got a problem there. So be careful about that and understand how you're getting your money back. Um, participation rights, the right to participate in future rounds. That's going to make economics dividends. You have to pay them to someone. Dividends are sort of like an accruing interest rate, if you want to think about it that way, and anti-dilution, you know, what happens if you raise your next round at a lower valuation? You got a whole bunch of problems there, but make sure you're looking for a weighted average cost of capital and not a full exit there. So we got a lot of terms, so we're going to do this. So control bank terms in a term sheet, which you're going to get and carry over into your doc set. We have to think about who's on the board of directors. So how many seats do the investors have? How many seats do the common holders or founders have? And who makes the decisions? Do you have any veto rights by the investors? Let's make sure we keep an eye on that because that's a lot of control, right? Um, ownership of a share class. Maybe a shareholder owns a percentage of a share class and 50% or greater is required from that share class to make a decision. You got to get their their approval. So that's effectively a share class veto right to so make sure you know that. And then if there's any other investor rights, oh, shoot, do you need to give them reporting? How often? Do you have to make them cookies on Tuesday? Like, what else do you need to do? Good grief. So, very many funding agreements. We got a ton of paperwork here, and it basically says all the things that we just talked about in the term sheet. So, we're going to get this done, right? We're going to have a certificate of incorporation. Think about that like the top line umbrella doc that's going to sort sort of set out what are the share classes, what are the overarching rights of those share classes, what was the initial purchase price of those share classes, how do people get bought out of those share classes, other things of that nature. We have a stock purchase agreement. That's how you then investor buys the shares in a deal. And this is where some of those things that we talked about in terms of attestations, do you own the rights to your IP? Do you own the rights to your licenses? You know, who else has participation here in these joint ownership agreements? Do you, have you filed your requisite corporate filings? You've got to attest to all of that in your stock purchase agreement. And particularly if you're a CEO or a key employee or key person under that document, you better be darn sure that you have those answers correct because it's going to be your neck and the company's neck on the line if you you know didn't disclose things you weren't up upright up, uh, forthright we'll use that word and honest um, so make sure you're being very direct about that investor rights agreement that's kind of talking about it's a very I would say standard document we're talking about future rights for investing but also you know say you're going to do a public registration, what are the rules of the road there, stock restriction agreement, you might see those, like certain people cannot sell their stock during certain periods of time, we have a voting agreement, it's going to kind of talk about, hey, you know, in these, we're all, you're agreeing, new shareholders, that these boards, the board of directors is going to look like this, and this is who's going to represent there, and you acknowledge that, and then some other items too. You've got a bunch of ancillary certifications that you have to deal with that seem very painful, but again, very important. Have to have requisite corporate authority to enter into these things that we're doing every day. And then the dreaded legal opinion. Good grief. So make sure if you can, try to avoid the dreaded legal opinion, but sometimes you just can't get out of the things that you can't get out of. And so legal opinion can run up your legal bill a little bit, which is why I generally try to encourage people to get out of it. But more and more frequently, investors are looking for that legal opinion, so you just kind of got to deal with it. And you have to be patient with your lawyers because it usually has to go through a couple cycles and a few different partner reviews, and so just be aware that sometimes that takes a little time. Why? We're almost done. Okay, it's almost done. So, um, you know, disclosure is issues in IP. I think Brock touched on this really well, but, you know, complete and full disclosure is the key. No one likes surprises the day before your transaction is going to close. No one likes surprises found in the data room. If you have a problem, get ahead of it. Okay, I cannot stress. Get ahead of it. Louder for the people in the back, okay? Um, making sure that you have your NDAs for your trade secret and material. When in doubt, disclose. If you have a question about that, call your counselor, okay? Because I do think 
maybe there's something once in a while where you don't have to talk about it, but more often than not, it's better to be open, honest, and forthright, and you can sleep better at night that way. Okay, almost done. Oh, the documentation issues. So, cap table issues, like I talked about. Oh, shoot, if you've got a cap table issue, Get ahead of it before the closing, not after the closing. If you close your funding round, nothing is more problematic than a cap table issue gone awry. And this could be, shoot, you thought you, you terminated someone in their agreement. Something didn't get cleaned up there. Of course, you publicized after your closing. Now everyone knows about it, and they're pumped about that. So they want a piece of the pie, too, so they come out of the woodwork. Success always brings that. Um, you know, side letters, and let's talk about that really quick. Side letter is a an agreement outside of all of your other agreements is if we don't have enough agreements. Um, and that's going to set out some additional uh, rights that maybe some investors have. So make sure if you've got those in place from previous investors, make sure they still work with your new doc set because typically they carry forward. Make sure you've got your approvals in place. Sometimes existing shareholders have a right to participate in your rounds, and that is a real bugaboo if you did not go and talk to them in a timely fashion. So make sure that you are, you know, staying in, in step with those timelines and those timeframes. And then tracking down those rogue shareholders. It never fails. You've got someone and they own, let's call it 5% of your company and they're not really that involved anymore, but you'd love them dearly because they participated and helped you get to where you are today. Turns out it's COVID and they are living in like, I don't know, Key West and you can't find them. Make sure that you are communicating frequently enough with your folks so that you know where they are, how to find them, and that you can uh, communicate with them and get answers when you need them. So today's CLE code, before we get into any questions here, um, as you can see on the, on the screen, but um, we do have a couple more housekeeping items. You know, we only have a few minutes here, but, you know, we will open it up to Q&A. If you've got any questions, don't hesitate to type them in the box. Under questions, I think you can just drop down, type in something in the chat box, let us know what those questions might be. Uh, we'll address the questions as we can. If we can't get to your questions, we'll reach out to you afterwards um, and follow up with you. And if anything we covered here today, you're like, ooh, I got a problem, or I just want more information and you're not already a Thompson Time client, don't hesitate to reach out to Roger or myself. Um, Roger's information was provided earlier. I think mine might be on the next slide. I'm going to touch that now and see what happens here. But, <laughs> oh, both of ours are. So, uh, so you can see that there. Those are our emails if you do have questions and you don't want to ask them in the chat box. Additionally, if you look left, you should follow me. Um, you know, I would say follow me on LinkedIn at LK Stencil and also on Instagram at legally underscore Lens, where we have lots of fun content, sometimes about legal stuff, sometimes about fitness. Anyway. Uh, now I think we would open up the floor for uh, questions, so we'll start to wait for those to come in and take a look at those. And Roger, if you're out there, I'm assuming some of these questions are going to be for you. Hey, uh, Lindsay, uh, we are actually on a hard stop today. We have we have to be we have two minutes, and there's another presentation coming up in a moment. So um, we've been advised to. One o'clock. So, do you have a question? Do you have a question there? So, right now, it doesn't look like we have any questions in the chat box. It just looks like people okay. are going to say they're following up with us afterwards. So, we'll give it another minute, but, um, you know, we might have done this, like, right in the nick of time and gotten this done by one o'clock. <laughs> Don't hesitate to ask questions because no question is a dumb question. We can always follow up with you afterwards. And you have our emails down here, too, if there's this question that's very specific to your company. So with that, we only have less than 60 seconds to go. So um, I would say now we'll probably sign off, say our adieus, and uh, we look forward to seeing you, you next time.